Hey, this is the Hard Truth of Tony Shaver on the America Out Loud Talk Radio Network and on the America Out Loud Podcast Network. Check us out. Project Sentinel, projectsentinel.com and .net. Uh, this is the umbrella which we do things uh, under as a think tank. And we are all in our little tent, powered by Six Hour, Never Settle. I had a choice of what I carried in combat. I always carried the best. I recommend you carry the best. The best is Six Hour, Never Settle. We're also uh, sponsored by Swiss America. Call them today to get a copy on uh, of their book, the Secret War on Cash. It's a newsletter that actually helps you understand the things you must do to protect your family in these challenging financial times. At the time of the taping, we just got word that we have over 3% inflation still. So we're working on that. And also, uh, be sure and check us out, Project Sentinel, as I said. And you can get the old shows on our website, The Hard Truth with Tony, thehardtruthwithtony.com. And uh, we'll be doing all sorts of different things in the future, highlighting all the work and research we've done. But uh, enough about that for now. We're going to jump right into today's uh, guest. And I'm reading it from the car because that's what they give me. Mike McCormick. Mike. Uh, hey, Tony. How you doing? He's written a book. It's called The Case to Imp- Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden. I think I know that guy. And that's right. I have met him. Uh, and uh, former White House stenographer Mike McCormick traveled the world with Vice President Joe Biden. I can. I don't want to ask about the Penn's undergarments and travel because that would be getting in trouble probably. 2011 to 2017, he, he recently published this book, uh, The Case to Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden, now uh, uh, advancing up Amazon's best-selling ranks, which I was an Amazon number one Amazon best-selling author when my book came out. So it's great to see that his book is making progress. And uh, Mike is an eyewitness. And I I, I feel your pain, bud. <laughs> I witnessed the, the times and accounts of jo- the life and times of Joe Biden. Is that like the life and times of Josie Wales, Mike? Welcome to the hard truth. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Tony. Uh, Joe Biden is nowhere near what uh, Josie Wales or Clint Eastwood could ever be. Yeah, he's just a kind of a big floppy, bombastic, bo- boast all the time guy. He talks tough but doesn't deliver. So that's that's the real Joe Biden. So, I mean, so, you know, we've met and you reminded me at the pre at the pre interview that we met at, at CFAC a while back with my our friend Ed Henry. Mm. But I want to tell you on a personal, what was it like to be around him? Because now, I, full disclosure, as I mentioned, I testified before him in the Senate. Mm. He was on House Armed Services. I ran into him at, at the Excella Lounge in New York a couple of times. And he always seemed like this really vacuous kind of guy that barely knew what he was doing, always tried to say the right thing, but never really invested any personal skin in the game for anything. It was all about Joe. Is that, is that an accurate summation or not? Yeah, all about Joe. I think it's one of his favorite phrases he uses all the time is point of personal privilege. Yeah. So he, was, he was willing to put himself in front of everything. You know, that's a phrase they use in the Senate when they want to sort of stop all the debate and tell a side story about their personal life or their personal view. Yeah, and how you could define his whole career, especially in the White House, is that, you know. So the book I wrote, um, the case to impeach and imprison Joe Biden, as his stenographer, I traveled with him only overseas. I didn't travel in the states. Gotcha. In the states, they had a White House communications agency deliver all his audio into our office, so I worked from that. But overseas, when he needed a stenographer, and I worked for the press office, so when there was press on a on a tri- trip. He needed a stenographer there. I would be in the back of the plane, Air Force Two, and um, with a recorder at the ready in case he walked back and wanted to have an interview with the press or if one of his uh, press assistants came back. Jake Sullivan did it a couple of times. Colin Call did it a couple of times. And, you know, we do a recording back there. And then I'd type the transcript as quickly as I could, often sitting on the plane or back in the hotel rooms. And then once out in the field, we did that. So a lot of time in his presence, but I don't know him personally. I've never spent, he doesn't know, he wouldn't know who I was. Like you said, he's kind of dull and vacuous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if he saw me standing there with a, with a recorder a couple of times, he thought I was a press guy and he, you know, treat me like a press guy. And I couldn't in front of him tell the press, 
I work for you, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> you know, don't ask me. I'm not going to ask you a question. I work for you. So he, he was kind of a, like you said, kind of lightheaded. Well, I've always compared him to uh, Commandant Lassard from Police Academy, kind of yeah, uh, right. bungling and, uh, you know, barely able to function, but somehow having luck of the Irish, which he does brag about. I think he's Ethiopian, Jewish. Uh, American Indian, uh, Eskimo, and uh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> there's, there's Commandant Lazard. Yeah, that that is Joe Biden, and I guess uh, Joe must have eaten the goldfish. Because I don't think. Well, you know, Joe Biden has a very dark, cunning side too. He didn't get to be the president by being a nice guy. He oh, got to be the president by being a behind-the-scenes killer operative, and he took a lot of people out on his way up. And so, you know, I look at what's in the book. Um, first of all, the, the first, what happened was I got a hold of the, a copy of the Hunter Biden laptop from yeah. uh, Marco Polo, the guys behind me. Here they go, these guys. And yeah. uh, they wrote the report on the Biden laptop. And they, in 2021, they gave me a copy of it. So I started going through the emails. As I knew I was in on travel with him in April 2014, I looked at the email traffic. And there is all the evidence you need to impeach Joe. Holy cow. It's right there in the emails. And that's what I put into part of the book. And the other part of the book is, this is the evil part. This is where he should be in prison because, frankly, it's treason. He went down in the, into the cartel-associated governments in the Northern Triangle countries in South America. And he made deals with people who were working with the cartels. And he knew it. He gave them hundreds of millions of dollars of our taxpayer money to a to facilitate their drug smuggling and their human trafficking. And that's what we're seeing along the Southern border right now. Uh, no doubt. And I, I have every confidence you're saying the absolute truth based on my knowledge. My One of my dear friends, Kurt Weldon, uh, said that Joe Biden's nickname in the Senate was quid pro quo Joe. Yeah. That, that you don't get anything out of Joe unless you deal with him in some form. And that usually means monetary. So this has been an open secret forever. And the, the fact that this guy was allowed to go down and deal with very dangerous people for profit, which, uh, by the way, we're still, you know, that's another reason he's got the southwest border. I think he's been bought off by the cartel you're talking about, the Chinese and the the uh, Ukrainians, because right. those seem to be the three areas he's giving great, I mean, immense deference to. And uh, obviously that means that I agree with you should be in prison, but we'll get to that in a bit. I want to go through a couple of other things real quick as we get there. So I, too, had access to the Hunter Biden hard drive. I was uh, I got it through Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. And, and those, you know, I was able to. And then also I had direct contact with um, with uh, JP's uh, lawyer, uh, uh, JP Mac. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically enough, the guy that first brought it to the FBI was a guy named Colonel Ron Scott, was one of my colleagues on a black special operations program regarding these nukes. Hmm. And, and I, so I knew instantly because Ron was involved, it was authentic. It's like I knew Ron as a as an Air Force officer would never, a real guy, would never have lied. So I knew early on. But what do you make of the fact, Mike, that even people like me, and I was, you know, I was in the media. I'm a media, I'm a public figure. Uh, I've got credibility. Uh, I was the National Security Advisor to Trump 2020. I advised uh, multiple members of the Trump administration. I actually helped out the Obama administration recovering Bergdahl and a secret operation. So it's not like I'm a I'm chopped liver, but somehow those 51 intelligence officers uh, who uh, weren't actually given access to the hard drive, and I had access to the hard drive, and I said it's real, and they didn't even have access, said it, it has the earmarks of Russian disinformation. How did they get away with that? I mean, to me, that's insane. Well, you know, part of the so part of the job of being the White House stenographer with the press office was understanding how the press work. Right. And the press, you know, shield around Biden and Obama was thick and impenetrable. So they just had to come out with a barely, uh, you know, barely researched reply to this thing. It didn't, yeah. you know, earmarks just means... You know, no it's opinion, and, and, and they, they, yeah, and they never. And I know questions. those guys; they're idiots. Yeah, and they never got questioned. Yeah. You know, and and the, and what they were really doing was hiding what was going on behind the scenes. I mean, you know, it was the cartels in South America. It was also, 
you know, Biden was doing stuff with this company called Metabiota. The, Joe Biden, so I was on the trip he took to uh, China in 2013. He goes to yeah. Beijing and Hunter's on the plane. Right. But before you go down that path, Mike, I, let me ask you one question for you, because I want yeah. you to go through this in great I want to give you all the time to, for, to open this up in a second. Yeah. Has anybody from DOJ or FBI ever talked to you about any of this stuff? No. And I'm ah! trying to get, yeah. Seriously. I mean, it's ridiculous. I went, Seriously. so yes. Yeah. Let's go down this this path just for a second. Yeah, I just wanted I wanted to check on that. I mean, holy cow, really? Yeah, I try. I've been trying wow. for over a year. I sent a witness wow. tip to the FBI through their website. I'm familiar. Never with heard it. back. I've yeah. I've made my own reports that were ignored. Yeah. Yeah, never heard back. Then I I made got a little bit of media last year about this time with Fox and a couple others, and that got into the oversight committee. Yeah. And they said, they said, hey, we want to talk to you about what you know. So I went down and talked to oversight committee guys informally, investigators. And they said, you know a lot. Why don't you talk to the Homeland Security Governmental Affairs Committee? Yeah. Talk to their investigators for about a couple hours. Never heard back. And then I started seeing how they were doing this investigation into the Devin Archer interview over the summer, the Hunter Biden interview uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. And I was like, they're not going to get to they don't want, they're covering for Joe Biden. They don't yeah. want to get to this information. Oh, no, I it's told, the same thing they did with Benghazi. Trey Gowdy yes. was not there to get to the truth. He was there to put a, a convenient veneer on it to make sure nobody asked questions. No, I I get yeah. it. Yeah. And so it's, I wrote the book. The mono party. It's, you know, it's the court of public opinion. That's the only avenue we have. So yeah. I put what I knew in the book. But there was a whole, there's a whole chunk of it I couldn't put in the book. It's frankly too hard for the American public to swallow at this time. They, they well, still think Joe Biden is a bumbling idiot. He's a really dark, evil guy. Well, you can be an idiot and be evil at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. He I is. Mean, yeah. No, I mean, I, I mean, I'm being a bit funny about it, but it's true. I mean, Joe Biden is an idiot, but he's evil, and he's got that streak yeah. of cunning. He's got that one that one gift he has is the eye is, is the ability to judge the political wind of things and jump ahead yeah. of it and, and yeah. capture it. That's that's his that's his uh, superpower. Yeah, uh, that and uh, being able to fill more depends per day than any other human being on earth. But that's another story. We don't want to go down that path, literally. <laughs> so let's let's talk a bit about uh, Hunter Biden, uh, yeah. first felon Hunter Biden. Well, soon to be first felon. Sorry, I'm I'm reading ahead of here. But let's talk about your experience on the plane with Hunter, and let's go down there and, and let's open this up for the audience. Yeah. So I've never I've never met Hunter. You know, he was on the plane. Yeah. Joe traveled with his family fairly often, um, mostly with the granddaughters and sometimes the um, daughters-in-law. So Hunter was only on one trip, foreign trip. Hunter and Bo did a lot of travel nationally during the campaign. They were on the plane a lot. I, didn't, I wasn't on those flights. So we go to um, this one trip we're on. We go to Beijing in 2013. Hunter makes a big deal with Bo Hai, um, I can't remember the exact name. Bohai, I think it's Bohai RST. Bohai yeah. something RST. This is the uh, Jonathan Lee um, uh, connection that he had with this uh, Chinese Communist Party affiliate business. This yeah. is what the Oversight Committee is, is looking at, all these millions of dollars of money transfers that came into him from this company. Bohai Harvest RST is the name of their company, sorry. Yeah. And so... He does that deal. But also in that trip, and this you, you'll you understand this. So Joe Biden at this point in time is Xi Jinping's best buddy. Oh, but yeah. He's the vice president. And Xi Jinping is the president of China. And they're scheduled to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Then they're going to have some staff meetings in the Great Hall of People in, in uh, Beijing, right there across from Tiananmen Square. And... Joe Biden walks in there. And I'm, I'm supposed to go in the building. And I get held off at the door of the Chinese security guys are like, you're not going in there. So I had to go sit in motorcade. It went on and on because Joe Biden hijacked the meeting with Xi Jinping. <laughs> this is a vice president who took over the meeting with the president of China. I can see he that. kicked all the Chinese advisors out of the room. He made a comment about it later. And there's a White House transcript that reflects this. And he has this long one-on-one -on -one meeting. And then the press start asking about it. There's a press interview at the end of this uh, uh, event. And there's senior administration officials. Jake Sullivan is there. And they're like, wait a minute. How come, 
how come he got everybody out of the room? And what was he talking about? Was he talking about, and then all of a sudden they just end the conversation. So it's a very strange meeting. Well, as soon as Hunter gets back from this trip, he's, he and his Rosemont Seneca Technology Partners start investing in a company called Metabiota. Metabiota, to go through it really quickly, yeah. moves right into doing bio warfare research with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency in Georgia and then in Ukraine. So, and, 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 and Joe is helping set up these contracts. They start getting million dollar contracts yeah. and they're oh, getting me. So, so I just want to remind the audience that uh, this is all available in your book in much greater detail, right? The case to impeach and imprison Joe Biden, right? This part of it isn't in the book because oh. this is the really dirty part. I couldn't gotcha. put this in the book. Well, let's so talk was, about this. Yeah, let's keep Yeah, going. let's talk about this. Yeah. Um, so Joe Biden is setting up these, these contracts and there, and there's email traffic between Rosemont Seneca Technology Partners. They're Silicon Valley guys and they're, and they're venture capitalist guys and they want all this basically government funding flow into them and they're just patting Hunter on the back and his team, his quote unquote team. Well, a week before Joe goes to, uh, like two weeks before Joe goes to uh, Ukraine for the first visit to re rescue Ukraine after the invasion by Putin, oh, yeah. uh, Metabiota officials are in Hunter's office in Georgetown doing a big uh, presentation set up to get more funding. And then Rosemont Seneca Technology Partners guys go into the White House. They meet with Joe Biden's staffers, a guy named John Deloche and a guy named Neil Callahan, meet with his staffers. And then Hunter and Devin Archer, who are also Rosemont Seneca Technology Partner guys, they go in to see Joe in person. And they're actually, they walk out of that uh, meeting. It's April 16th, 2014. And they start emailing about getting more funding from Metabiota, and we're going to go over and, and I'm going to join the board of Burisma. I mean, it's basically a planning meeting he had. And that night, this is where Obama comes in because Obama is the invisible hand behind all this. Yeah. That night, Joe and Obama do a, a joint event out in Western Pennsylvania. And they ride for a, a, a pretty long period of time in the back of Obama's limousine, which is like one of the most secure conference rooms in the world, right? They have a big long talk there. What are they talking about? Joe Biden in that at that day, I've seen the uh, daily daily schedule. They had yeah. a presidential daily brief at 10. They had another meeting uh, between each themselves. And then they had this big talk at the end of the night. What are they talking about? So I think this is Joe setting up the bio labs into Ukraine and Obama saying green lighting it. And Joe and Hunter and his Rosemont Senga Technology Partners buddies are cutting on the deal. And that goes on into the fall. So let's break it down a little bit, because first off, this undermines Joe Biden's comments that he never had any knowledge, direct knowledge of his son's business activities. So that's that you're saying that that didn't happen. That, that yeah, means, no, that Biden, absolutely. And, and Biden my book had direct access. And was yeah, involved. and my book proves that inside and out in m multiple ways. So that's so that's a good point. You need to get his book. Uh, the case to impeach in a prison, Joe Biden, uh, and, and go through that because I think everybody needs to understand that there's a lot behind this. This is a lot more than a few allegations. So let's continue the, to lay out the logic here. I know where this is going. You know where this is going to Victoria Newland and uh, and uh, the Binman brothers. So let's let's talk a little about the path to Vicky, Vicky uh, or Tori. I guess they call her Tori because she's at a a, a, a a uh, terror. So terror and Tory are very closely related. Just <laughs> but let's keep going. So they they lay out this plan, and obviously part of the deal is they're all going to get uh, enriched by this this financial entanglement, right? Yeah. And the other thing that happens in 2014 is so what Metabiota does. Their job is they're in China at the time that uh, Joe and Xi Jinping have this meeting. They're working alongside Eco Health Alliance, Peter Daszak. They're working alongside the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And they're part of something called Predict One. And they're looking at bats, bat droppings, to pull viruses out of that. So they're working on, they, they get the idea, hey, there's going to be a big thing. In February of 2014, um, Lisa Monaco announces a global uh, health initiative 
um, pandemic surveillance, like a biosecurity surveillance program that they want to do out of the uh, Obama White House. Lisa yeah. Monica was behind that. And so this this all feeds into this project these guys are doing. They're building these um, bio labs in Ukraine. They're doing all this testing. One of the things they're doing is they go around all these countries they did in China, they did in Southeast Asia, they did in Africa, and they collect samples of, of what animals may have viruses that transmit to humans. One of the viruses they pick up is Ebola. In 2014, Ebola hits Africa, and Metabiota is already there. Wow. They have a lab in Kenema, Sierra Leone. It's not very far from where the Ebola outbreak starts. Yeah. And, and as the outbreak can, advances, uh, Metabiota's activities are viewed with increasing suspicion by World Health Authorities, the World Health Organization, and um, Medicine Sans Frontier, the um, Doctors Without Borders group. Yeah. And so these guys are over there operating, and it blows up on them. So then they're... This whole um, Ebola scare makes Metabiota a lot more valuable as an investment because yeah. they've got a tremendous future in this rapidly um, fearful environment. We're afraid pandemics are coming, they're coming. And so that's when uh, Hunter and Joe were at the, at the height of this, uh, this investment. So basically one of the notable items that we're discussing is the fact that there's a direct link between Wuhan, Joe Biden, and Peter Daszak, and a, a, a guy that I think he's now a garden gnome in a home in New Jersey, Dr. Anthony Fauci. I, I think that there are, well, he is. I think, I think he's doing well, too. He's a little, you know, he's kind of short, but short guys do well as garden gnomes. What can I say? It's, it's kind of their chosen calling, so. But uh, back to, but I think what you're saying is there a link, there's a link between all these folks. There's a link, and the link starts, it gets even worse with the introduction of Ron Klain, Joe Biden's one of oh. his op operatives, as yeah, the Ron. Ebola czar. Yeah. And that's when Ron Klain and Anthony Fauci become best buds. That relationship rolls all the way through into the Wuhan pandemic, which comes out. And Ron Klain is then, at the time in 2020, he's the uh, campaign advisor for Joe Biden. He winds up being his White House chief of staff. Right. He's telling everyone in the world how terrible a job uh, Trump is doing with uh, fighting the pandemic. And uh, Fauci's right there as his best friend helping sp spread that message. So there's oh. a lot of behind the scenes, you know. No, no. One of our uh, senior fellows, distinguished fellows, is Dr. Steve Hatfield. Steve's doing a book because he worked there in the White House with um, with Peter Navarro. He was our yeah. guy there. And, right. Uh, they were trying to straighten it out. And I got to tell you from what Steve said. There was no getting past uh, Bricks and uh, Fauci and yeah. their nonsense. It was like, uh, no matter how much you tried to, and, and that's, I, I'll, I'll say this, uh, Trump made a mistake of, of listening to those knuckleheads. I think it was a bad mistake. It, it, it was ne never, they were never going to do the right thing for the country, let alone for Trump. So so let's um, let's open this up just a bit more because we have to take a break here in about three minutes. But, um, you know, one of the things I'm interested in, uh, Obviously, Mike is uh, Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland is—I um, I don't want to say she's satanic, but yeah, you know, for those watching, she kind of looks like Satan's sister there. You know, I mean, look at those eyes. I mean, it's just uh, there's no way of putting a, a, a happy face on that, literally. So, uh, so let's t tell tell us about Tori and, and her role because she. And the videos out there, she admitted that we had bio labs in Ukraine, right? Right. She did that two years ago in congressional testimony. Yeah. What she called them bio research facilities. Yeah. So the Victoria Newland, and it's not just Newland. This is the Vinmans. This is the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt. So I fly into Ukraine on an airplane in 2015 with Joe Biden, Air Force Two. The person who's the Air Force Two greeter, and there's a video of this, and there's a lot of coverage in my book, is um, Vitaly Klitschko. He's currently the mayor of Kiev. He's one of the top guys in their government. He's probably got a, pockets full of money from all this uh, aid we're sending him. He's right. standing next to Pyatt and Victoria Newland. At the time, Klitschko was secretly on the board of Burisma Geothermal, working directly under Hunter Biden. And Hunter's Rosemont Santa Technology Partners Group was invested in Metabio, the bio labs. 
Now, technically, at this point in time, Hunter was out of that group. He got outed for being um, when his uh, use of cocaine discharge came up from the Navy Reserve came out. This Rosemont Seneca Technology Partners Group got rid of him and they started a new group. They kept their investment in Metabiota. Yeah. So Hunter technically wasn't involved in it. And frankly, I think the CIA was the one that pushed that information out so they could get rid of him. Because well, the, CIA, the CIA started d dealing with Hunter Biden's uh, group right around this October 2014 time frame when Ron Plain gets named the Ebola czar. And, yeah. you know, their InQtel venture capital group starts dealing with them. Oh, I know who InQtel is. We could talk. Uh, so we have to take a break right now. But uh, we're, we are uh, joined this week by Mike McCormick, his book, The Case to Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden. I like the link there. Uh, why wait for one before the other? You know, I think you should be in, in prison right now. Why wait, you know? Uh, but we'll be back with the second part of the of the hard truth. We'll continue this conversation with Mike in just a moment. All right, this is the hard truth with Tony Shaver, part two. Still powered by Sig Sauer, and uh, we're still here as a team. We're on the America Out Loud Talk Radio Network, also on the America Out Loud Podcast Network, uh, and we are also uh, Project Sentinel, ProjectSentinel.com, and .net. So, and as I mentioned, we're powered by Sig Sauer, never settle. I had a choice of what I carried in combat. I always carried the best. You should carry the best. If you know what's good for you, you better. Uh, always carry six hour. And also, check out Swiss America, 800-289-2646. Uh, Phil and Tony Schaefer sent you for their great newsletter, The Secret War in Cash. You can never be uh, too prepared to deal with the economic headwinds that are here and coming. They're not over yet. And so always look for us on our website, thehardtruthwithtony.com for the old shows. And always a shout out to our friend, Cherie Curry, who does our theme music, uh, Rock and Roll Oblivion, and our bumper music. Cherie, we love you, Mick. Hope you're doing well. We're hoping to have you back. So we're back. Uh, second part of the show with Mike McCormick. We're continuing our conversation on his book, The Case to Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden. It's available on Amazon. Moving up. Uh, Mike has got some great inside details, which, by the way, the FBI don't don't want to look at. So if the FBI doesn't want to look at it, that means it's something good. So just saying, <laughs> you know, it's something like juicy and important. So Mike, let's continue where we left off. And again, thank you for being on with us today. It's a, it's a great conversation. So we were talking about uh, Tori Newland and, and her evil. And just before the break, for those who uh, who were watching probably had their their screen shattered from the presence of Victoria. I apologize for any computers that may have been shattered. By yeah, here it is oh, again. there it is! Oh my God! <laughs> no. Where did you put that up? Oh my God! Maybe you have. She a looks nice like question. she's related to Hillary Clinton, doesn't she? She has that if, kind of Hillary Clinton look about her. If, if, oh, if yeah, hemorrhoids but... had a spokesperson, that would be. <laughs> Ouch! That's oh. gonna hurt. Yeah, just, no. That's yeah. gonna. Oh, hurt. I forgot to mention. Uh, we are joined by the rest of the team. Not that they're related to hemorrhoids in any way. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> please Thank don't use the preparation H. I think that's the way it went, right? So we are joined by the 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 hardy uh, Chris Cordani and and the the uh, hardened Elizabeth Breckenkamp. So welcome, team. Okay, Trevor. I guess that's a compliment. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're you're hardened after listening to uh, <laughs> uh, what the Bidens have done to this country. There you that's go. right. Oh. And so yeah. Mike's going to continue to educate. So tell us about the, the link of Tory to uh, the Vindmans, because that's always a good story, I'm sure. So, so you know, the, the U.S. Embassy there, and Tory was hand in glove with them, with Pyatt. And so was so were the Bidens. Burisma did stuff hand in glove with them. They denied it. They've been covering it up. And so um, she's part. she was part of that whole rolling out, you know, what Vladimir Putin calls a soft coup. The Ma yeah. Maidan, Maidan, Maidan revolution, right? Yeah, Maidan revolution. So in 2015, she's standing next to this guy, Vitaly Klitschko. He probably drove there with her in a car to meet Joe Biden. She probably set it up. And so she would know not only that he was with Burisma, but also she would know all about these bio labs. And that's, at the time, top secret stuff. No one talked about it. Right. Now they finally admit it. Yeah, there's bio research facilities there in Ukraine. And it was uh, Rosemont Seneca Technology Partners investment in Metabiota. Uh, Hunter and Joe, yeah. I, I think Joe Hunter had a 20.5% stake 
out of the first two funding rounds. I'm not a venture Holy capital cow. guy, but wow. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> wow. So out of their out of their stakes. So Rosemont Singer Technology Partners had a sort of an investment chunk, and out of that chunk, he got 20.5 percent. Five percent went to his partner. Um, uh, Archer. No, Archer got his uh, got an Archer got 20 percent, and he split it 10 and 10 with uh, John Kerry's stepson, Chris Hines. Uh, it was Eric Schwerin split. He got 5% yeah. from Hunter. So that leaves 15% for Hunter. I think 10% went to the big guy on that. Yeah. Ugh. Well, I don't doubt it. I mean, who else? I mean, he's got all these houses he's bought with kind of questionable means. That is Joe Biden, quid pro quo. So, um, so Mike, part of the issue that I'm seeing, obviously, is that... Um, I, I don't doubt for a minute what you're saying to be absolutely true be, based on what how I know the government works and how these deals can be kind of hidden in plain sight. But my question to you is, why is it that the Trump folks didn't pick this up and use it as vigorously as they could have or should have? Is, do you have any thoughts on why they did not do that? Because, I mean, this is dynamite stuff. Um, well, I you know, it's almost like they use the top secret uh, program to hide the grift. Well, yeah. look, uh, they've they used um, in my story, Able Danger. They hid the stuff they didn't want us to talk about in a, a top secret program. That's where it's still hidden now, by the way. Just I, right. so I know how that game play is played. Just saying. Yeah, and they probably use that same formula. I mean, that Joe's been around for fifty years. He's been doing yeah. that for decades. So I think that's what they did. And you know, the other thing with Trump was they they had these predict they had these uh, bio surveillance programs set up. This came out of Obama's White House. So they had to predict one. The funding yeah. for that ended in 2014. Then they set up something called Predict Two, and because the Ebola crisis was so serious, they funded it to the max. Well, that was only five years. Trump came into office. He said, "I'm cutting these things." But the Predict Two ended in September of 2019. That's right when Wuhan kicked off, and basically, mm. Fauci and all these bio surveillance guys were saying for five years. If they don't fund us, there's going to be a pandemic. And that's what they did. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so um, Unbelievable. So basically, Unbelievable. I think it may be safe to say that uh, most of the evil we're facing right now, uh, all roads lead back to Joe Biden. Is that overstating it or not? I mean, I, that's, seems I think bad. that's pretty accurate. And Obama or just Biden? And Obama. Well, well, yeah. Obama knows how to keep his hands clean a little bit there. That's what Biden's yeah. are for. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I was, I kind of yeah, wanted ahead. to ask a question about Obama and Biden. So, um, so it seems like, you know, according to the news, we haven't heard Obama made any kind of, make any kind of official statement saying he's endorsing Biden for a second presidency. Yet it seems like, you know, when, when Biden was Obama's vice president, and all these pictures and every time the news cover them, they they look like they're a BFFs. We're best friends forever. So I haven't read your book yet, but I did just now download it. Um, I just now bought it. So thank you. What is the relationship there like between because I do think Obama is a huge part of this. And I haven't like I, said, I haven't read your book yet. But what what was there like a fallout between the two of them since Biden? stepped into the white house or like what's what's up with that because obama is not endorsing biden for a second presidency that's a good question so here's my take on it and you know we had we had uh white house and Arbor people who were close into both michelle obama's inner circle and obama's inner circle and the uh, and like his body man and those guys his real close inner circle and they were you know these sort of romantic relationships so they would come back in the office and dish about it um, I think Biden is the puppeteer and Obama was the puppet at the beginning of the relationship. Huh. Interesting. Oh. I think if you look at the way Obama came into the White House, Obama did a big speech in 2004 at the Democratic Convention. That sort of set his star on the rise. 2006, he gets uh, voted in the Senate. Joe Biden puts his arm around him and says, hey, I want you to be on the Foreign Relations Committee with me. I'm the chairman. And he shepherds him into that mm. because Joe wanted to run in 2008. He knew he wanted to get this guy in his wing. He didn't think he'd run as quickly as he did. He didn't think he'd get beat by him, but he did. Yeah. So Joe behind the scenes might have known stuff that Obama was doing that 
shouldn't be widely known and might have mm -hmm. used it as a way to say, hey, I want to be the last guy in the room with you. He used to brag about that all the time. I made a deal with him when I became his vice president. I was always the last guy in the room. And who knows what kind of leverage he used when he was the last guy in the room. So they had this relationship where Biden got all the big assignments. He got Ukraine. He got Iraq. He got the uh, reform, the um, Recovery Act right out of the gate. So he was sort of the guy who was doing the heavy lifting. And Obama was the public face, the glorified, you know, aberration guy. Behind the scenes, oh. Obama's people disliked Joe intensely. They had no Ooh. respect for him. He was just an old, geezy guy. He was like, you know, the crazy uncle puts a lampshade on his head and dances at the Christmas party. I mean, he was yeah, really ridiculous. And so as the as the relationship sort of continued, they were they reached a working relationship where it worked. But I think, you know, Obama didn't really want to he didn't want to endorse Biden for his first run as president in okay. 2020. Right. He was very late to the game on that. And right now he's sort of backing away from it, too. I think there's a lot of bad blood behind the scenes on those guys. Well, he kind of had to. He, he kind wow. of had to step up and endorse him. Who else is going to, I, I guess, who else is going to be A, controllable and B, electable? And that's the issue with the Democrats right now. With the Democrats, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's been my contention that, uh, and, and again, I, I agree with you. I always thought it was Biden that was in, was in control when Obama was in office. However, in 2016, hmm. I also thought that Biden could win the presidency on his coattails but he preferred to, well, uh, breathe, I suppose, rather than run against Hillary. No, the reason he didn't run in 2016 was Bo died. Bo died I'm, in 2015, and he was kind of knocked off. And there's stuff in the laptop where Axelrod comes in in the fall of 2015 and basically tells Biden, you don't have what it takes. You won't raise the money. You can't do it. Let Hillary go. And Biden surrendered. And they're still pissed really? about that. I'm surprised yeah. Biden would surrender. Oh, wow. Well, well it, it's it's more about, in my judgment, and strategy. Please correct me if I, correct me if I'm wrong. It's the, the, they are much more of an elective hive mind, and they basically try to pick someone who can best kind of open the spigot for all of their overall shenanigans, right? I mean, it's it's not about leadership. It's about who can be the the biggest crook to keep every, you know keep all, the gravy train going for everybody else. Is that is Kind of what yeah. they do, you think? Oh, yeah, I think that's good. right on the nose. Yep, that's yeah. right on the nose. Yeah. Joe Biden knew where all the dirty stuff was, yeah. and he could keep it going. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Hillary, I mean, Hillary is part of the same group. I mean, Jake Sullivan and all those mm -hmm. folks are kind of the same uh, evil bumblebees that kind of fly around the, you know, Ron Klein. George Soros. Um, right now, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Cohen's lawyer is uh, who's testifying against Trump. Is is one of Hillary Clinton's lawyers. I can't remember his name, uh, but it's one of the. It's like there. It's all kind of this uh, amorphous group of of, of this uh, this hive of evil that kind of travels together. It's um, you know. But anyway, so anyway, Chris, back over to you. I didn't want to interrupt you. Well, party. I'm I'm with I'm 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 in there too. I I always thought again, like I said before, I thought that Biden kind of found a way and perhaps used Bo as an excuse not to run. But I, but it's interesting. People told him he couldn't mm -hmm. do that and couldn't win. Uh, you know what? It's funny. People vote for the, the most likable or at least the person that uh, would win the popularity contest. I thought that would be Biden over Hillary, because if you consider 2016, two of the most unlikable people in either party ran against each other. That yeah. doesn't normally happen. And that that's and, and you're going to see that now again in 2024, which will be rather interesting. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, here's here's something that comes after this. Let's say, let's say Donald Trump wins. I've always thought this would be the interesting point about that. Who is the heir apparent to the uh, Obama Biden? Uh, let's just say the Obama Biden connection. The Democrats don't seem to have anybody who is a uh, who is likable enough, oh, no. liable they, enough, or could actually do. do the job. And we're not. I, I, I don't think it's going to be Michelle. It's it's Gavin Newsom's hair. It is. I'm sure it's it's hair. You know, the just hair the hair. Bro. Just the hair. Gavin That's Newsom's true. hair can be president. Well, he has to yeah. be protected from running California into the ground. There's no protecting from that. Because this That's, is what they're going to do. They're gonna, they already have. Trump wins. They're going to call him a racist for four years and connect him with every Republican that runs. But the Democrats still have to put somebody viable up there. Who do you think? I, you no, know, I, I, I hear no one. I don't see I hear that. Uh, I, I, I hear that. 
No, I hear that Lizzo's available. I heard she quit singing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I thought she was the uh, deputy health commissioner or the deputy health oh. secretary. She could oh, be the minister of Kisco. Of she could be the oh. minister of Kis Crisco. That that'd be a good. Job. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, this is bad. Oh, yeah, bad. the good thing is, Tony. The good thing is, is time. It's the the time has come. Oh no, really? That's right, Mike. You're oh, gonna love this. Time. The time that's is time. time for Tony's takes. By the oh, way, snaz and jacket, Tony. Yes, thank you. I am not a number. I'm a guy that wears clothes very nicely. Thank you. That's right. That's right. And that's right. He's gonna bang his fist on the desk and resign pretty soon. All right, I already broke one go. mouse today. I don't want to break another one. Well, let's get your takes. Everybody, let's do a round. By the way, by the way, on that note, no, Chris, before we get into this, on that oh, yeah. note, I was told by one of uh, Patrick McGowan's friends who watched your special. Uh, we're doing a little plug for your special, right? Really? What's the name of your special? Uh, it was the uh, the show is called The Outhouse Lounge. It was the Prisoner Special. Yes. So, it's called, yeah. so uh, one of Pat's uh, friends saw the interview and said, "Go back and rewatch the end of Danger Man." There's a connection between. The, the pounding on the desk and the breaking of the the um, the, 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 play, the the saucer and the last episode of John Dr of John Drake of Danger Man. Just saying, I don't know what that is. Uh -oh. I haven't checked it out, I but I was told to go back and watch it. Okay. Yes, I was told to go back and check it out by someone who talked with. I have to do that now. Yeah, I, I will do that. You know, the Just funny thing is, saying. I never, I never got to say when we discussed who number one might be. I never got to give my theory. It was really Lancelot Link. <laughs> Really? I thought it was, um, I guess that's a good theory because, you know, he is, he was pretty monkey-like and there was a monkey in it could be the last Clyde the monkey. monkey? Yeah. <laughs> it could be Clyde the orangutan from the Clint Eastwood movies. Uh, Did you know that the cartoon Danger Mouse was de based on Danger Man? Did you know that? Yes. Danger yes. Mouse is based on Danger Man. Oh, that's right. I but I, I don't know who Penfold was based on. Penfold, I don't know. Penfold is, yeah, I, I, maybe Morocco he was. Morocco Mole. Maybe. There you Maybe. Go. I, I enjoyed that as a as, you know, a young adult. Just... Tony's Takes is powered by Sig Sauer. Sig Sauer never settle. And we don't never settle, settle for, we don't settle settle. for bad takes. Never we settle. only have Tony's Takes. That's right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, or lady and gentlemen, well, well, well. Michael Cohen's former lawyer, Robert Costello, testified on Wednesday to the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Government Weaponization. That's a lot. Cohen told them that, to, to, Cohen told him, he says, Cohen told him, that he didn't have anything on Donald Trump. That's it. That's what he said. What's your take, Tony? Well, I think it's hard to have anything on Donald Trump when uh, he basically sells all his clothes at Macy's. I don't know. Did you see that Donald used to have his own line of clothes? So you couldn't have anything on Donald because you could have it on yourself. Nice word, you know, nice uh, blazer. Ivanka nice used to have her line at Macy's. Yeah, look, I've got it. I got it. I got a Trump like tire too. After, so. Yeah. Do you remember That's, that one week after uh, Trump? Uh, uh, came into office, Macy's conveniently dropped all of Ivanka's and they said it w had nothing to do with politics. Oh, I course. still remember that because that pissed me oh, off. Anyway. So that's true. <laughs> he had nothing on Trump, but he had uh, he had he had Trump's clothes on. He wore. As a matter of fact, I would have asked uh, the question of, uh, of Cohen uh, on the witness stand. The, how many Donald Trump ties do you still own, Mr. Cohen? <laughs> <laughs> he was probably using that money cologne at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the Trump money cologne. Remember that? Mike, any any comments on uh, on the, the, the no Trump, uh, no, not have anything on Trump? Uh, Cohen, you know, just the guy's ridiculous. I don't, I can't understand why they would base a court case on this guy's testimony, but that's where we are now. Sad to say, the process is the punishment. It gets never going to stand up in the end. Yeah, their hatred for Trump is just it. it there's no end to it. There's just no end. Yeah. Oh, here's something. There's no end to. Disney has pulled the get this. Disney has pulled Tinkerbell from its theme park, oh. the meet and greets, and it's mm -hmm. planning to design the character again a different way because get this, she is problematic. That's what the kids say, I guess. She's not, quote, as, as, as from what I understand, Disney said, quote, representative of our inclusive focused values and thus are currently in the process of redesigning an updated Tinkerbell for modern audiences. So Disney dumbs down another iconic character. And it wasn't wasn't even in the way that I thought they would do it. But what's your take, Tony? My take is it's redesigning her around Captain Hook and uh, <laughs> oh. or, or Lizzo. Don't don't ask or don't tell. Just saying. I, I think that's where it's going. Yeah, I think they're gonna make Tinkerbell so she's like she's 
she lives on welfare she's single <laughs> she has like six kids from six different daddies that makes oh, her like that's good hey right? yo <laughs> oh yes oh yes uh, i think you're right and and, and, and no job because why get a job she's going to live in a little fairy trailer down by the river i think they have trailers down by the army. river i think yes. i saw that one right <laughs> Oh, and she'll it. kind of look androgynous. She can't look too feminine or too right. masculine. Was that Mike? What were you saying? It seems like, you know, the dress that she wears is very feminine. And it's almost, it's very similar to what uh, Betty Rubble and Wilma Flintstone yes. wore. Flintstones. Yeah. Right? Very That's short. Prehistoric. Short, short. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe that just bothers them. They're too uh, traditional or something. But here, here's I, what I would say. I would too say girly. I would say this. I'm guessing that Disney, in its, in its infinite wisdom, is going to design her and uh, model her off of Pat, the old Saturday Night Live character. <laughs> yes. Pat. That Pat. That was a great. So nobody great. knows. Yes. Yeah. That would be interesting. Uh, uh, but Disney, <laughs> Disney has this. Disney has destroyed everything it's touched. It's it's murdered. It's, yeah. it's murdering its regular characters. You saw what it did to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They buy Lucasfilm and. They make mincemeat out of the Star Wars franchise. It's barely recognizable. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, Chris, come on. Leslie Hedlund and the Acolyte. I mean, what could go wrong with heavy we Harvey Weinstein's executive assistant doing a series? What could be wrong about that, right? I mean, come on. That's a good point. I didn't think about it that mm. way. Because, uh, but, but here, here's the here's the other thing about Disney. They're, they'll just ruin everything. I think when, when Walt finally gets his head screwed back on, when he gets unfrozen, he's going to be really pissed. What are your thoughts on that one? So I think Doomcock uh, will be very well versed in that since he has yeah. the skull of Calderon already kind of set up. So he'll There's know what to do with Walt's head. As a matter of fact, we should send a note to Doomcock and ask him what he plans on doing with Walt Disney's head when he gets it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's one for you. Tony, Mike, and Elizabeth. We have a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. When you hear the term 10% for the big guy referring to Joe Biden, do you all do you like me think of Arthur Carlson when it comes to Joe Biden and big guy? Oh, so, you know, I, know. I, I, I love that, WKRP so much because I went to college in Dayton and I am very fond of, of Cincinnati for any not just for the chili, but it's a cool place. So I, I don't want to su sully uh, Arthur, but I, I do say that that, that the ten percent I think refers to the, the amount of tapioca that Joe can uh, have per Per day in his diet. I think that's what the ten percent is. Ten percent of his daily. Uh, ten percent tapioca is the man. Well, he, yeah. he runs the country almost as well as that's right. Carlson yes. ran WK. Tapioca, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, I didn't even think of that. That's that's a good analogy. <laughs> I love that's it. Right. So, so what? So what makes everybody else everybody else? I would say that uh, uh, we can make Anthony Blinken Herb Tarlick. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Actually, no, maybe he's more or less Nesman, and Herb Tarlick goes to Rachel Levine. Yeah, I don't know. It's a <laughs> tough call. Oh. You know, and by the way, I just, I said this earlier on the air, and I'll say it again here, because we, we, you know, you saw that Tony Blinken was playing uh, Keep On Rockin' in the Free World, and, and oh, uh, Kev, let me point out to the audience, you need to check out those lyrics. Those lyrics are an anti-war song that actually was written about American imperialism and spending uh, money on foreign wars and not actually spending money for domestic issues. Gee, I don't know who else could be doing that right now. And uh, <laughs> I mean, did anybody actually bother to actually research? Like, maybe you want to like check into the song because it's like anti-war and anti -American. No, I don't think he's bright enough to even do that. And, and by the way, for, and for the audience to remember, you know, he used to play uh, guitar. The first thing I saw, I, I thought when I saw that, remember Second City TV? The Reese's Monkeys, uh, yes. man, that, that's what I, and he Reese's sings monkey. about like, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm having Eugene Rick Lovett? Moranis. No, Rick oh. Moranis. He sings oh. like Rick Moranis. And by the way, just like in, 80, when, in 82, when, when, when Blinken in college, did you all know that his nickname was Spanky Banana? Did you know that? <laughs> did not know that. <laughs> well, now we that's know. That's a great name. Oh, uh, you know. It's better than money. maybe not, but it, it it sounds right. Just saying, it just it just fits. It, it just fits. fits. <laughs> All right, Chris. Any more, no or do I get to be funny on my own? So, uh -oh. oh my gosh, Chris, you're you're oh. muted. Chris, yeah. you're mute. Chris, Chris, you're Chris, muted. Unmute Chris, yourself. You're you're muted. 
It has been like a pantomime. I'm sorry, there my dog go. is going nuts. Oh. Okay. All ready? right, we'll cut that. We'll we have, cut we the, have the one, crazy dog one, out. Yeah, I got this. We have one and a half <laughs> minutes left. So ready? All right. Yes. Okay. Back. Go. All right. I'm gonna All go right. do. The, I'm gonna put the book up first, and I'll just see that. All right. Ready? So anyway, um, so do you want me to do a wrap? You're going to do the wrap. Yeah, do the wrap. That's a better right, idea. So, then I can put the book up. Anyway, so that's enough hilarity. We'll we'll leave Spanky Banana off doing whatever Spanky Bananas do right now, and we'll talk about the book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about Mike. <laughs> Woo! I feel like Johnny Carson today. I don't know why. So hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. So we, we've had our, our guest today has been Mike McCormick. Has been a great sport. His book, uh, The Case to Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden. Joe Bidenopolis, Joe, who's been uh, a member of the every community on on planet Earth, from the Jews to the to the yeah, Ethiopians, right. he's a little bit of everything. And so, uh, Mike, his book is available on Amazon. Uh, no, don't walk, run out to Amazon or run to your computer if it survived the the Tory Newland flashes on our screens. Hopefully, you have a computer, <laughs> and uh, we'll have you. You know, and and by the way, uh, Mike, we'd like to have you back. We want to talk more about this. Yeah, we're doing that. Would be great. And I'll be writing a lot about the um, this metabiota revelations in my Substack. The Substack is Midnight in the Laptop of Good and Evil. Then type in the oh, the great name, the Laptop of Good and Evil. We'll we'll be sure and promote that as well. So, Mike, thanks for being a great sport, and we're we're definitely going to have you back. And thanks uh, to the crew. Uh, Be sure and check out Six Hour. Be sure and check out uh, Swiss America and. and, and, of course, Cherie Curry, uh, TameSawChick.com. Great work. And she's still seeing rock and roll, which is always wonderful. Her age. My age, too, by the way. Uh, anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, this, version, this episode of The Hard Truth, Tony Shaper. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for being here. Bye.